For all its beauty and splendor, the wilderness can be a cruel teacher. Many understand that the sea is dangerous and the storms treacherous, but they have never found these dangers sufficient enough reason for remaining ashore. Please click the subscribe and like buttons. This is Outdoor Disasters. Tokelau, which comprises three atolls, was first settled by Polynesians around 1000 AD. The three atolls operated relatively independently but had contact with one another, intermarrying and occasionally fighting wars. Located in the South Pacific, many authorities conclude that overall the Pacific Ocean, and specifically the South Pacific Ocean, is the most dangerous in the world. Parts of the South Pacific are incredibly remote and well beyond the reach of rapid assistance in an expanse the size of a dozen Saharas, in which there are only scattered specks of land. As the southern part of the largest of the world's oceans, any trip into the South Pacific must be planned carefully. In October 2010, three teens from Tokelau would find out how dangerous and remote these waters can be. Etweni Nassau, 14, Samu Palesa, 15, and Philo Philo, 15, drifted 300 kilometers across an empty and little-traveled section of the Pacific Ocean. It began in the grand tradition of ill-considered ideas, with a group of boys and a bottle of booze. The boys were gathered in their clubhouse near the end of the only road in the only village on the Pacific island of Atafu. Atafu is one of three atolls that make up the nation of Tokelau. The total amount of land on Atafu is 1.4 square miles, population 524. The nearest atoll, equally tiny, is 57 miles to the south, well beyond the range of visibility. The closest significant landmass is Samoa, a 28-hour ferry ride away. There is no landing strip on Tokelau. There are also no dogs, prisons, lawyers, pavement, or soil. The land is mostly bits of broken coral. The highest elevation is 15 feet. Coconuts and fish are the traditional diet. From any point on Atafu's shoreline, nothing can be seen but water, all the way to the horizon. They were drinking vodka, smoking cigarettes, and telling stories. It was getting late. Then someone brought up the tale of the teenagers. Five or six years previous, three teens had taken a boat without permission and broken one of the cardinal rules of Tokelauan society. They'd ventured into the open ocean without the escort of a Tautai, a master fisherman. The ocean is an unpredictable and occasionally violent place, and the title of Tautai, bestowed by the island's elders, is equivalent to a driver's license. Even Tautais do not venture far offshore. The isolation of Atafu can at times be difficult to bear. Philo stated Atafu felt like a prison. The desire to escape can become overwhelming. And as a plastic jug of vodka was passed around, the old story soon morphed into a new idea. By the time the jug was finished, the idea had become a plan. And so almost on a whim, when the plans became serious, when Samu announced he'd be willing to steal his uncle's new boat, and most everyone in the clubhouse began backpedaling from their bluster, Etueni spoke up. He said he was in. Philo, Samu, and Etueni fanned out across the village. Their first mission was to find gasoline, and they soon collected about 20 gallons in five plastic jerry cans. They stashed the stolen gas in Samu's uncle's boat, a silver-colored Froza, made in New Zealand, with a 15-horsepower Yamaha engine. There was nothing fancy about it. A couple of unpainted wooden benches, a tiny storage space in the bow that could keep a few things dry. The only items inside were a small machete and a wooden mallet used to club fish. Its freeboard, the distance between the water and the top of the boat's sides, was just 16 inches, enough to repel only the smallest of waves. The boat's best feature was not visible. Inside the hull were three large air-filled aluminum cylinders, pontoons that made the craft exceptionally stable. After loading the gas, the boys again separated dashing the short distance from the dock to the village. Philo sneaked into his house and grabbed a green tarpaulin, a large plastic sack containing 20 coconuts, a white ceramic teacup, two packs of Pall Mall cigarettes, and another jug of vodka still sealed. From his refrigerator, he took two bottles of milk and a craft mayonnaise jar filled with water. Samu, meanwhile, climbed a tree and knocked down nine more coconuts. Etueni had been instructed to find fishing equipment, but he was concerned that he'd wake someone up and get caught. So there was no fishing gear. The boys boarded the boat 
To steal their resolve, they opened the vodka, poured it in the teacup, added a bit of water, and passed it around. This time, Etwaini joined in. Samu started the engine. It was the final chance to run home, to sleep in a bed. Etwaini later admitted that as he sat in the boat, he'd thought that this was a dangerous and stupid idea. I almost jumped off, he says. But then Philo began yelling, and Samu and Etwaini joined in. A rebel yell, a primal scream, a howl that tried to both express and eclipses their nervous, excited joy. They soon began shouting people's names, those they'd stolen from. They teased Samu's uncle. Ha ha, we're leaving, we stole your boat. And they motored through the gap in the reef surrounding Atafu. It was the first time any of the boys had been on the ocean side of Tokelau without a master fisherman. Their plan was to reach the next atoll. They figured it would take three or four days. They had only the clothes they wore, shorts and t-shirts and sandals. They continued drinking. Etwaini was bartender, water and vodka, in their one teacup. Philo was the first to tire out. He curled up on the bottom of the boat. Samu and Etwaini stayed up, still drinking. Somehow, in his insobriety, Etwaini took off his shirt and lost it overboard. Samu controlled the engine. We just had an idea of following one star, says Etwaini, but we didn't know what star it was. Then Samu too grew sleepy. So Etwaini drove for a while. Eventually he switched off the engine, and soon all three boys were passed out on the flat metal bottom of the boat. Etwaini woke first, to the noise of a couple of dozen seagulls flying around. He could no longer see land. The bright sun, he realized, eliminated the idea of following one star. Philo was next up. He immediately vomited over the side. Then Samu awoke and he too threw up. They began cracking coconuts, banging them against the rail of the boat, drinking the liquid and chucking them away. They didn't even bother scraping out the coconut meat. Then they finished both bottles of milk. They broke out the cigarettes. Only six were dry. They smoked them. They ran the engine intermittently. It was a warm and overcast day. Their new idea was to follow the seagulls. The birds would naturally head back to land. But the birds seemed to be flying randomly, maybe in big circles. As the afternoon wore on, they grew a little hungry. They wondered what people were saying about them back on Atafu. Eventually, the sun set. We were still in a good mood, says Philo, not that hungry. They slept again in a puddle on the bottom of the boat. The next day, they saw an airplane. It was flying low, and they figured it was looking for them. Etuani waved, and the other two boys immediately teased him for wanting to be rescued so soon, so he stopped waving. Philo and Samu didn't think two days was enough to seem heroic. They figured as the plane flew away that it would eventually be back. Back on Atafu, a town meeting was called to discuss the disappearance of the boys. The prevalent feeling was, oh no, not again. The island was still recovering from a tragedy eight months earlier, in February of 2010, when three men on a barge were caught in a storm. Their boat capsized. The bodies washed ashore. And now three more were missing. The forecast was for stormy weather. Help was requested from the Royal New Zealand Air Force. It swiftly sent out a P-3 Orion military surveillance plane with radar capable of detecting something as tiny as a submarine periscope. The total search area was more than 8,500 square miles. The plane searched three separate times, returning once to Samoa to refuel, for a total of eight hours. At this point, approaching the third night with no idea where they were, their supplies pitifully meager. You might think that panic would have set in, but they had not. They were sure someone would soon rescue them. On the next day, they finished the mayonnaise container of water and continued drinking the coconuts, this time making sure to scrape the insides. By that evening, they had used up all the gas. They could now only drift with the current. They threw all the fuel containers overboard. When they went to sleep, they had exactly 11 coconuts left. Their sleep was fitful and wet. The wind picked up. Etuani, who'd lost his shirt the first night, was especially cold. In the morning, there was still nothing but water all around them. No rescue boat, no airplane. Etuani finally said it. Shouldn't we be found by now? The response from the others? They laughed at me, Etwaini says. Their mouths grew very dry. Despite storm forecasts, it had not rained at all during the trip, and the only edible items were coconuts. That day, they each drank and ate too, an extravagant use of their supplies, yet it wasn't nearly enough to slake their thirst or satiate their hunger. By the time they went to sleep that night, 
they had precisely five coconuts left. At sunrise on the fifth day, the day the teens who had previously stolen a boat had been rescued, the boys all finally admitted aloud that they'd like to go back, that they wished they were home. Day six, the three were well aware that they'd made a terrible mistake. Soon they were down to their last coconut. Thirst was like a hand around their throats. That's when we started thinking about drinking seawater, says Etwini. Philo warned them that this was a bad idea. The next morning, Samu, the lifelong Tokelauan, announced, I'm drinking it, and dipped the teacup into the ocean. He started sipping. Then I got sick of looking at Samu drinking it, says Etwini. Me too, says Philo. They all drank seawater together. Finally, more than a week into the trip, it rained. And for the first time, the boys used the green tarp. They took it out and spread it open in order to catch rainwater. Samu, Philo, and Etwini saw plenty of fish. The shadow of the drifting dinghy created a kind of artificial reef that attracted many small fish, which in turn enticed larger ones. There were also the ever-circling birds who dive for fish during the day and sleep bobbing on the water at night. All the food the boys needed was visible to them, yet just out of reach. For a while, Etwini tried fishing with his hand, just holding it in the water over the side of the boat. He says he actually felt fish, but could never grab them. Through sheer happenstance, the boys did actually catch a few fish. The chief disadvantage of the low-sided boat was that seawater continuously splashed in. A wave of any size would break over the gunnels. Bailing during the day, using the mayonnaise jar, was constant. And at night, the boat slowly filled up. But every so often, a total of four times during the trip, the waves carried along a fish that would flop into the boat. All of their skin soon grew torturously itchy rashes. The boys have dark latte-colored skin, but the sun still overwhelmed them, igniting severe burns. About two weeks in, they began bickering. By this point, the boys were starving. It's like your stomach is being ripped apart, says Etwini. Of course, they weren't in good moods. We got angry easily, says Etwini. They had nothing to divert themselves. They lost track of how many days they'd been gone. The disk of the sun slowly traveled overhead. In rough weather, they rode the great ocean swells, rising and falling, sometimes 30 feet or more as if the sea were breathing. The horizon was naked, save for the incessant waves that formed a swaying divide between ocean and sky. Later on, a storm blew in. It rained for two and a half days, the only major storm the boys encountered. They couldn't bail fast enough. Water rose to the benches. They shivered violently. Rain, even in the tropics, comes in cold. So they wrapped themselves under the tarp, sitting cross-legged. From outside the boat, they would have looked like a small green haystack. It was warm in there, so despite the boat filling up and in danger of sinking, they sat for an entire day, huddled naked, rain hammering down, thrashed by winds. They say they felt like a team at this moment, dependent on one another, helping one another, just the three of them in a tiny boat amid an endless sea. A few nights later, they spotted a ship. It was a large one, the deck outlined in orange lights. They hadn't seen a boat since leaving Tokelau. It was difficult to tell how far away it was. They thought, let's make a sail and catch up. So they held up the tarpaulin and tried to harness the wind. But it was exhausting work. So they debated whether to jump in the water and swim for it. Should only Samu go? Should they all go? They couldn't decide. And the boat motored away. They felt terrible. They wondered if that was their only chance, if they'd die before seeing another ship. They thought about all the food on that boat, the warmth, the beds. They blamed one another for not jumping in the water and at least making an active attempt at saving their lives. Now all they could do was sit in their dinghy and wait. Soon after the ship passed, Etwini quit. He stopped talking. He curled up in the bow. He didn't even sit up. He just lay all day in the bottom of the boat, mute, mostly unmoving eyes half-lidded. He did this for weeks. Deep in his silent stage, pondering suicide, Etwini was alone, confined to the bow of the boat. One afternoon, a bird, one of the gray gulls that hung around the dinghy, landed on the boat. The boys were half comatose. They stared at the bird. A few days later, another bird came. It was just after a big rainstorm, and there was water in the tarp. This time, Samu tried to catch it. He was stealthy. He crouched low and grabbed the bird by the neck. They ate a bite of raw meat, but even in their hunger, it was worse than yuck. So they dried the carcass in the sun, 
and it was good. Afterwards, says Etwene, we wanted more. They drank the water in the tarp. The sea was so calm that waves didn't splash into the dinghy. Etwene ended his silence. The bird finally helped, he says, and I started talking. It was a good day. We were friends again, says Etwene. We were happy that day. But no more birds ever landed on the boat. The relief provided by those few bites of meat did not last long. It only served to reawaken their hunger pangs, their long, dormant stomachs gurgling with digestive juices. But there was nothing more. Soon they were hungrier than ever. The sun continued to beat down. The sea stretched all around, limitless and cruel. At times, Samu and Philo spent a few minutes bobbing in the water to cool off, but Etwini felt too frail to leave the dinghy. During one of these dips, the boys found barnacles on the bottom of the boat. Samu was the first to eat them. They were better than not eating. They gave some to Etwini. Then, during one swim, Philo let go of the boat, trying to snap off a barnacle. The current was strong, and he drifted away. He was too weak to catch up, but Samu held the dinghy in one hand and swam with the other, tugging the boat. It was an incredible feat, considering his condition. He managed to swim fast enough to reach Philo. He grabbed his hand. He helped haul him into the boat. That was the last time anyone went swimming. They were crazed with hunger, desperate beyond any measure. Their bodies were rotting before their eyes. Starvation lowered their internal temperatures and they were colder than ever at night. Their bodies had used up all their fat. It was working on their muscles. Their minds would go next. They ate some of the hair that fell off their heads. They ate bits of their fingernails. They were dying. And then the rash on Philo's skin reached the point of excruciation. He was under the tarp in the middle of the night and felt what he described as an electric shock across his body. He leapt up. He screamed, God, please help. Take this pain away. He yelled louder. God, please forgive me. He wanted to tear off his skin. He couldn't stand it any longer. He was finished. He grabbed the machete. He begged Samu to kill him. Stab me. Stab me, he begged Etwini. I felt like I was burning. I'd rather die than endure the pain. I was screaming at them to stab me. I was serious. Both boys refused. How are you going to see your parents? Samu asked. Eventually, the pain subsided. Exhaustion gripped him and so they prepared to die. They stopped bailing. It was too much effort. Etwini got sick. He vomited repeatedly, but little came out. It stopped raining. They drank seawater. We all quit, says Etwini, like it makes no difference if we die or live. They were all lying about in the bottom of the boat in the most weakened possible state, covered by the tarp, close to death. And then Samu pulled himself up for a moment to see if rain clouds were coming. And he said one word, he said, yes, and he raised his arm and started waving. Boys, he said, I can see a boat. Etwini and Philo didn't believe him. A few times before, he had pretended to spot a boat, and when the others looked, he'd laugh. No one else thought it was funny. So they made him promise he wouldn't do it again. Now they thought he was joking once more. Boys, Samu said again, get up. There was something in his voice. Philo and Etwini got up, and there, directly in front of them, was a ship, the San Nicanau. I started waving, but I could only lift my arm for a few seconds, says Etwini. I wondered if it was a dream. They feared the ship would pass by. It didn't seem to be stopping. But then, from way above, the ship's navigator, Ty Fredrickson, called out. He asked if they needed help. The boys screamed, yes, and the ship lowered a small rescue boat. Fredrickson snapped a photo. It is an extraordinary and heartbreaking image. Three naked boys, staring at their rescuer, reduced to skin and bones. Philo and Samu started crying, but Etwini didn't. He was too dehydrated. I couldn't cry, he says. I had no more tears. They had floated some 750 miles. They'd been gone more than seven weeks. With help, they were too weak to walk. They boarded the San Nicunao. Their dinghy and its engine were also saved to be returned to Tokelau. They sat in the galley, bewildered and overwhelmed by the scent of food. Fredrickson gave them some electrolyte drink and a bit of bread. Etwini ate an apple, but it made him sick, and he vomited into a bowl in the kitchen. They showered. They borrowed clothes. Samu made the first phone call. He called his grandmother. There were celebrations across Tokelau. The boys all slept that night in one bed, in Fredrickson's berth. At the Colonial War Memorial Hospital in Fiji's capital, Suva, the boys were treated for extreme dehydration, fungal infections, and second-degree burns. They were anemic. They had elevated heart rates, gross muscle wasting, and widespread infections. Etwini lost two teeth. 
Leanne Pierce, Tokelau's director of health, says they would likely not have survived another week. They spent a few days in the hospital, then flew to Samoa, where they moved in with a Tokelauan family to rest and recuperate. Samu, who had never before left Tokelau, came down with the chicken pox. Finally, just after Christmas, they were cleared to take the long ferry ride back to Atafu. They made it back to Atafu, where there was a big welcome feast. Samu gave a speech in which he apologized for their actions. Everyone says that God's got things in store for us. They could feel it. Atafu was too small for them. There was too much water everywhere they looked. All that suffering had just brought them back to the place they nearly killed themselves trying to escape. Within two months of returning home, they all left Atafu. Philo and Samu went with their families to Australia. Etwaini moved with his family to Hawaii. None of them know if they'll ever go back. The sea is like a wet desert. There's no food, water, or shelter, and in every direction the view is simply a glistening sheet of nothingness. Not to mention dangerous predators abound, lurking just beneath the depths. While slim, you can survive. Don't discard any clothing. Multiple layers can keep you warm during cold nights. On hot days, drape or prop clothes overhead. Never drink seawater. If you have a raincoat, detach the hood and use it to catch and store rainwater. Plastic bags and rain boots also make excellent containers. Always rinse them with the first raindrops to wash away salt from sea spray. A boat's shadow can attract fish. To catch them, string jewelry into a lure. Shoelaces or unraveled sock threads can serve as fishing line. Save any uneaten bits for bait. Relax and find familiar shapes and clouds to ease boredom, and keep an eye out for planes and ships. If you spot one, use a pocket mirror or a smartphone screen to reflect sunlight. Important information so you can navigate. An outdoor disaster.